Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to begin a series of videos on Vico's The New Science. In this first of five lectures, we will examine the introductory material as well as book one titled Establishing Principles. This is a text which I apologize, it's taken me about three years to get around finally doing the videos for them. I got a physical uh, copy of the text back in 2019 um, after John Michael Greer had mentioned in one uh, Archdruid report post um, that this was one of the most influential influential philosophical works on his own thinking. He listed it along with um, Oswald Spangler's Decline of the West, uh, the work of Arnold Toynbee, the work of Ibn Khaldun. What all of these um, thinkers have in common is that they provided um, not just uh, very important works in the history of the philosophy of history, say that five times fast, the history of the philosophy of history. Um, so this is trying to understand history from a philosophical uh, standpoint, but um, the thing that um, Vico and Spengler, for example, have in common is that they do not buy into the idea, not supported, of course, by any of the historical facts, that um, a civilization can avoid decline. What you find with Vico is the idea that if you really understand history, you'll understand the finite life cycle which a civilization undergoes, ending, of course, in decline and fall. That is exactly what an examination of, say, the Roman Empire and so many every other empire, let's just say, within history, um, including, if you look closely, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the American Empire, which is currently well along the process of decline, but we don't recognize that because we have a belief not supported um, by any empirical observation of the facts, but simply a belief in uh, progress, which uh, you might call a religion of progress, as John Michael Greer does, or for me, it's the deep meme of progress. It's a sort of um, this uh, ge pseudo-geometrical structure behind your thought process, which you already have in mind, which uh, distorts the facts um, you encounter in advance to have to conform to this idea that um, history uh, has the shape of an infinitely ascending arrow. Well, with Vico, you find that in so far as there is a sort of almost geometrical structure behind the flux of data you observe within history, it is not that at all. It is rather, once again, a finite life cycle in which a given civilization will pass through the phases of birth, growth, maturity, decline, and then fall. And I think it's not a coincidence that Vico was able to um, give us that account of history, um, precisely because he was living before the deep meme of progress had really tainted his view of the matter, especially coming from um, Italy in the 18th century, in a nation which, according to Max Weber, the Industrial Revolution or, you know, the rise of capitalism had um, caught on a little slower, according to Weber, in the so-called Catholic nations like Italy than it had in the so-called Protestant nations. If you look at Max Weber's, um, the uh, Protestant work ethic and the, uh, you know, was it the rise of capitalism? I forget the exact title of that work, but of course, he makes the argument that Calvinist theology led capitalism to um, take off in the uh, Protestant nations first, because if you can't actually do enough good works to save yourself, you paradoxically end up working more. Not because you think you can save yourself, but rather to show the others within your own church community that you are indeed already predestined as one of the elect, and you evidence that because you actually are good enough to do the works, knowing that you won't get any um, reward for it. Uh, you're already predestined. So that is, of course, a whole nother discussion. But the idea that um, living in 18th century Italy, especially as Vico does, allowed him to have a perspective untainted by the ideology of progress, I think makes this an especially important work well worth our time to investigate. I'm really looking forward to this series of videos, but I'll remind you that this is a part of the School of Urban Text. Remember, you can join us there for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. All right, so if we now begin our group reading of Vico's The New Science, I think it would actually be best to start with the stuff that comes before the beginning of the text itself. And if you have the Penguin edition of the book, you'll know that that is the introduction written by Anthony Grafton. I say this from my own experience, uh, somebody who uh, received a physical copy of the text about three years ago, but was only able to start talking about it on YouTube today, because although Vico's New Science is an an undoubtedly fascinating book in which um, one can find some amazing or witty insight on virtually every page. One must admit that it is a rather unconventional treatise with a lot of twists and turns, and admittedly a good deal of repetition of the same ideas in strange and unexpected places. I think that the text's structure will likely bewilder the first-time reader who tries to just work their way through the book one 
uh, paragraph or sentence at a time. And for that reason, it would be better to start this group reading with a very general synopsis of the text's big themes as presented by Anthony Grafton once again in that introduction to the Penguin edition of the text. Grafton notes that above all, Vico's philosophy was explicitly formulated in opposition to that of Rene Descartes, which had become dominant in his own historical context of 18th century continental Europe. And Vico did this um, through challenging Descartes' tendency to devalue the study of historical phenomena in favor of natural science and mathematics, which Descartes did, of course, on grounds that the latter would satisfy the criteria of being the kind of clear and distinct ideas which Descartes had praised as the highest standard of truth and certainty, whereas historical phenomena seemed by their very nature to be doomed to obscurity, indeterminacy, and uncertainty. Interestingly, though, Vico did not argue that history is worth studying simply because it consists of so many interesting stories, which admittedly could never be submitted to the kind of rigorous methodology which could help the historian arrive at a kind of knowledge every bit as certain as that of mathematics. On the contrary, Vico attempted to beat Descartes at his own game by devising an axiomatic system in which one could arrive at absolutely certain results by building up a system of knowledge from a set of basic elements. You might recall that in Euclidean geometry, these were things like points, lines, planes, and um, axiomatic truths like every point in a circle is the same distance from the center. Well, Vico noted that um, you could actually do something like that um, with history rather than mathematics in that you could arrive at a paradoxical kind of truth which is instantiated within the flux of time by one civilization after another but which is better understood as an eternally valid or timeless ideal which had to have been instituted by God himself. Vico argued that this knowledge concerns the life cycle of birth growth, maturity, decline, and fall, which all civilizations in a pre-deep meme of progress era were recognized to undergo. Vico is therefore something of a Platonist because he seeks the pure form of civilization beyond the noise of so many contingent manifestations of civilization within time. But as a Christian, he finally solves the riddle of how such an idea can exist through attributing it to the mind and will of God, rather than fall back on the obscure and ultimately unprovable world of ideas which Plato himself had proposed, let alone fall back on any materialistic foundation as one would be tempted in modern academia to uh, try to, uh, to use as a foundation. Likewise, the purpose of this new science consists of decoding ancient history, methodology, and law through discovering the general laws of social and cultural evolution which any civilization is bound to instantiate. Oftentimes, Vico also formulates his vision of the new science in negative terms, largely through seeking to establish it as a means to avoid the kind of basic errors in one's evaluation of history which had plagued other thinkers. For example, Hugo Grotius um, was somebody who claimed to be searching for universal abstract laws which all cultures must accept as valid, but he missed his own point by disregarding any need to actually deal with the ancient texts themselves. This led him to fixate on so many imaginary stories of what could have happened within history, which actively contradict what the historical record itself had already revealed to anyone who had been willing to take the time to read what had already been handed down to us. This was all too predictable an error to be found in the kind of intellectual climate that Vico inhabited, though, since Descartes had also explicitly dismissed the study of texts in favor of seeking out a knowledge of universals which the mind could discover simply through its own power of thinking. The Cartesian subject, for example, would have no need to go outside itself to calculate the solution to a mathematical equation, 
because it had already been endowed with the truths of mathematics as so many innate ideas which it already knew even if it didn't know that it knew them. In opposition to Descartes, once again, Vigo insisted on the independence of humanistic and historical studies which could only be dealt with through utilizing the resources of a new science rather than fall back on the kind of methods which had already been developed and standardized by, say, the natural sciences. In that sense, Vico is a lot like the 20th century German phenomenologist Gadamer, who also titled his magnum opus on um, hermeneutics, Truth and Method, in order to argue that the truth of classical texts is not the same as the truth of natural science. They're both truth, just different kind. Nor is the method for interpreting um, such social phenomena um, instantiated within the classical texts the scientific method. It's still a method, just a different kind. Well, Vico, for his part, uh, revealed that the deeper epistemological origin of both Descartes and Bacon's errors lay in their misunderstanding of the principle that one can only understand what one has created oneself. Only God, under this view, can understand the cosmos, because he was the one who made it. Man, on the other hand, must study the human world, which is a world of law, institution, custom, and practice. Vico noted that because man makes his own history, each society passes through a recognizable series of stages which follow from the actions of humans within particular kinds of social institutions. Interestingly, Vico argued that the history of the Jews make up one single exception to this ordinary succession of historical stages, because God's divine revelation had already made them civilized from the very start. In pagan civilizations, which lacked that divine help, Vico noted that the people began as bestioni, or human animals, who lived in the wild, and only eventually, after a long uh, span of time, developed into heroes before finally turning into men in the proper sense of the term. Vico speculated that the stages for how this transformation took place were roughly as follows. He speculated that after Noah's flood, Noah's descendants rejected their father's true religion, which had been revealed by God himself, and regressed into the state of human animals. They wandered the earth and dwelt in forests rather than living in society. For centuries after the flood, there was no thunder Vico says, because the earth had not yet dried out enough to allow flammable matter to enter into the air to allow for the combustion of lightning to take place. When the earth finally became dry enough for that to happen, suddenly lightning appeared for the first time, and the fear of the unknown led the people to personify that natural force into the image of a god. This fear of the gods led them to accept repression, even including sexual repression by limiting reproduction to the confines of marriage alone, rather than maintain their former depraved state of unbridled sexual copulation, even including rampant incest, even between parent and offspring, says Vico. The stability of the family after the institution of marriage had uh, arrived led permanent settlements to develop which replaced the former state of just wandering around in the wilderness. Later on, Vico speculates, other wandering forest dwellers who saw that a society had been established um, asked if they could join the community, but because the only thing they could offer in exchange for the safety and protection um, of the master was just their own freedom and labor, you had the first social relation of slavery established, and as a result, the first laws. This would pave the way for the state to later replace the family as the basic social order. Likewise, Vico emphasized that every era is dominated by a spirit of its own, which can only really be reconstructed to someone viewing it from afar through reading as many texts as possible from that time. In particular, Vico himself had dedicated himself to a serious study of all the ways that um, Roman law had changed radically over time. This led him to refute the myth that Rome's 
early uh, law called the Twelve Tables had been inherited from the more advanced Greek settlers who were living in the Italian peninsula at that time, as popular convention held. Instead, Vico noted that the Twelve Tables reflect the particular stage of advancement which Rome, not Greece, was at at that time, and had organically emerged within that historical and social context in accord with the need for each society to develop autonomously. Similarly, Vico dedicated himself to a systematic study of Homer um, later on in this text, that'll be a subsequent video where we'll deal with it in detail, um, in which he showed that um, a lot of things we think about Homer are actually uh, contradicted by a close study of the text. For example, we think of Homer's heroes as um, um, being part of a very advanced civilization, but if you read the text closely, you'll not notice that um, they actually live pretty simple lives. Achilles is a king, isn't he? But he's actually portrayed as cooking his own meals. Um, Princess Nausicaa in the Odyssey was also um, washing her own laundry when she discovered Odysseus in her kingdom. Um, more significantly still, Homer's idea of the gods are beings who are not at all like the kinds of gods which somebody with a better understanding of God within, say, monotheism would hold. These are gods who are not all good, they are not all powerful, and they are not all knowing. They are rather limited by the same pathological character flaws as any mere mortal. A perceptive reader will um, see the depravity of Homer's gods um, as people by the way, who perform the most shameful of uh, sexual uh, sins, such as fornication, and even according to some myths of bestiality, uh, they'll see this as um, the, the signs of a civilization Homer inhabited, which had not yet advanced uh, very far. Likewise, once again, Vico is something of a strange combination of, on the one hand, um, Gadamer's emphasis on interpretation or hermeneutics, specifically with regard to social rather than scientific phenomenon, um, or a, a better term would be um, natural, um, physical, or mathematical phenomenon. Um, and on the other hand, Plato's belief in the possibility of an absolutely certain knowledge from grasping the idea or form of a given thing. Vico's new science has always been very difficult to interpret then, and even Vico's scholars themselves still do not fully understand, let alone agree with one another regarding its finer points. For example, it remains somewhat unclear whether Vico's historical universe is absolutely determinist, in that he claims that whereas the Jewish civilization had received divine help to avoid having to pass through the same stages of development as the pagan civilizations had to, all the others still follow the same trajectory of development, ending in decline and fall, in accord with an ideal of civilization which had been willed by God himself. It was not simply up to us to arbitrarily create that life cycle, it was something which God himself had already devised. Well, if that's really the case, is there any meaningful ideal of freedom to act within history? Well, that's a big question which um, you and I will simply have to decide for ourselves as we work our way through this text in its entirety. But in conclusion, I think we can assert now that Vico did believe that because man understands what he has made, the new science will promote a crucial turn from the study of the physical to instead the social universe and from the cosmos of the ahistorically conceived present to the explicitly historicized human past. All right, so if we actually begin our reading of the text by Vico himself, we'll notice that um, he begins with a very weird section titled Idea of the Work, which consists of his uh, detailed close reading of a painting contained in the frontispiece um, at the beginning of the book, which I um, just took a picture myself and shared on the screen from my own copy of the text. Now, Vico interprets this image in the frontispiece as basically um, portraying the well-known philosophical idea that metaphysics is above nature, and after all, that's exactly what you would expect if you speak Greek, for you'll know that nature in Greek is physis, from which we transliterate the term physics, whereas meta is just that which is above. And um, some speculate that the text metaphysics um, by Aristotle did not originally have that name. That was not 
some speculate, the um, title which Aristotle had given to that bizarre uh, study of first principles, highest beings, etc. Rather, some speculate that um, this was just a literal description of the location of that book within the library of Alexandria or some other library. Um, the only thing we really can say about this weird-ass um, treatise is that you can find it after the um, treatise on Fusus or nature, which is much easier to understand. A nice metaphor for the fact that Fusus or the world of nature, which you and I actually inhabit, is easier to understand than the subject matter of metaphysics, which goes beyond it. That is not at all to say, however, that it can't be understood. It's rather that the one who can understand metaphysics fully is just God himself. And that is because God, too, is literally above nature in a supernatural sense. Well, in contrast with the standpoint of God, the standpoint that you and I are limited to is one of people caught up in a world of human spirit and a world of nations, which are themselves made up of so many institutions as their basic elements, and therefore you and I do not merely inhabit a natural world, but a civil one. Whereas the previous philosophers had overemphasized the study of nature, Vico now encourages the reader to turn to studying man's characteristic property, which he claims is the social nature and the institutions thereof. Interestingly, at this point of the text, Vico seems to explain the problem of historical temporality in terms of man's own state of original sin. Original sin, Vico tells us, is what causes us to fall from the state of perfect justice, which of course no institution in this world actually embodies, into instead the all too familiar trajectory of a set of stages, each one of them as imperfect, or at the very least, every one of them imperfect in comparison with that ideal of perfect justice. There is no motion, then, unless one is imperfect, which is why history is the study of change, rather than the kind of study which Descartes argued could be limited to the contemplation of abstract truths already contained within the mind as so many innate ideas. For Descartes, you have the innate idea of number, geometrical shape, etc., and therefore have no need to go beyond the mind either within space or time. But for Vico, in addition to this temporal dimension of history defined by imperfection, he also emphasized the spatial dimension of history by noting that humans, by definition, do not live in solitude within wild nature, simply meeting basic survival needs as the beasts do. Humans, rather, by definition, live in a social world, which means that they live in a civilization, which means that they live in something regulated by human laws. Vico did not, however, interpret this as a sign of the um, humanistic cliché that man is the sole measure of his own truths, for Vico argued that the laws of a civilization are not totally arbitrary. They always have some basis in our intuition of God, however confused that might be. Even the earliest pagans saw gods on earth by fearfully misinterpreting natural forces like thunder and lightning into some personified figure modeled ultimately after their own nature. This is why the Greek gods of Homer are every bit as depraved as we are. Although Vico considered the pagan religions to have false gods, he still noted that Egypt, Greece, Rome, etc. went through the same phases because, as he shall explain much greater detail, in much greater detail later on in the text, um, metaphysics must, insofar as it is a valid science, um, provide a recognition that God's providence is at work in public moral institutions, above all, the law even of pagan societies. Because Vico saw pagan religion as something that began after Noah's flood, he noted that one can find parallel religions develop in any one of, the, of those pagan um, societies, be they uh, Egypt, Greece, Rome, etc. For example, all of them have a Jupiter archetype, or a god of lightning, and this was simply because all of them had passed through the phase of fearing the thunder in the same way and then reacting by personifying it. 
In contrast, Vico claims the religion of the Jews predates the Flood because God had already provided divine revelation to them from the very start. The Old Testament, therefore, you might have noticed, lacks the pagan archetype of Jupiter and all of the other Greek gods too. And this was because they did not have to pass through the phase of fearfully personifying nature into false gods. Interestingly, Vico also claims that the earliest pagans were giants in the literal sense of the term, but the Jews were always of normal size. One might very well ask, why were the pagan giants after the flood so large in size? And Vico tells us that the answer is um, the brutish upbringing of their children. In particular, Vico speculates that the practice practice of mass open defecation inadvertently fertilized the um, areas these people were inhabiting with so much extra manure that it led the people living there to grow much larger simply because of all the extra edible material growing there. Ironically, it was precisely because the Jews, who had been given God's help from the start, were always too civilized to litter the common space with their own filth that they were always of normal size. Vigo argues that um, whereas the family was founded through religion, the state was founded later on through law, as we'll get into much greater detail uh, later on. Well, the earliest ancestors, in contrast with uh, both of these, um, that is to say, inhabitants of family and of uh, legal society, um, they were, according to Vigo, just wild beasts who had no religion, they had no family in the sense that they were willing to commit incest, even it, with their nearest blood relatives, such as, say, parents. Um, and they only later joined civilization, which had been already founded by other people, in order to exchange freedom for safety. At this point of the text, Vico speculates that these refugees um, had nothing to offer the civilized except their labor, meaning they could only ever be servants and never owners of land. So they eventually reacted to that inability to have social mobility upwards by either rebelling against their masters um, in order to try to forcefully seize ownership of their land, or on the other hand, reacting to this predicament by um, sailing to other lands which looked empty in which some unclaimed territory could be seized by them. He claims that the Phoenicians were actually the first navigators of the ancient world in that sense. Well, Vico speculates that the rebellion of servants as a properly political problem led the kings to unite with one another, forming the first senate, which led agrarian law to become the first civil law in the world. With such civil law established, one could then derive many other institutions, such as a cities, uh, public authorities, war, peace, fiefs, census, commerce, public treasury, colonies, and commonwealths to list uh, Vico's own examples. In the absence of law, on the other hand, Vico tells us that only one thing can control the pathological drives of man, and that is, of course, religion. The most shocking hypothesis to a modern reader is Vico's claim here in this section that um, governments were, in fact, originally democratic. That is not the end stage of progress. And this was because the same human nature is shared already democratically by all. It was just the failure of democracies to actually enact any laws which could succeed in granting equality that led to the all too predictable problem of civil wars. Monarchy then was the second form of government because it responded to that failure by allowing the masses to seek out the protection of a strong king after their own democracies had inevitably gone corrupt. Vico tells us that the third form of government as ordained by divine providence was aristocracy. That would be a very interesting thing to consider in contrast with the way that history had been um, narrated to you by the uh, priesthood of progress. With that section finished, uh, book one itself actually begins. This is a book as a whole titled Establishing Principles, and the first section is titled Notes on the Chronological Table. This section begins by asking how advanced the ancient Egyptians really were. Now, there is, of course, a myth that Egypt was the oldest of all civilizations and that the other pagan nations had simply borrowed 
um, even their mythological archetypes like, say, Jupiter from them. Vico refutes this myth, however, by reminding the reader that all of the pagan civilizations had to pass independently through the same set of historical phases. Each nation, therefore, believed itself to be the oldest and to be the preservers of tradition with a capital T. But this was only really true, says Vico, of the Jews, and that was because their civilization was established before the Flood by the true god himself, rather than the false gods of paganism, which were themselves actually just formed in the imagination of the Gentiles on an ad hoc basis in order to meet particular occasions of fear which they had found themselves thrown in as a result, let's face it, of being not very advanced politically speaking. Likewise, the Greek gods you find within Homer are guilty of terrible things like fornication, adultery, and even bestiality, which negates not only the ideal of God, but even the ideal of civilization. You have to be a fairly unsophisticated, civil unsophisticated civilization to have that idea of God and worship it. The one thing clear from Vico's speculation in um, section one is just how uncertain our knowledge of ancient history really is if it is not guided by the superior methodology which his new science will actually spell out for us in detail. The new science then will establish the axiomatic foundations from which certain historical knowledge can be derived. This does not contradict the established tradition, he tells us, so much as it establishes a first foundation in an as yet unclaimed and obscure territory. We can have hope for such certainty because Vico assures us that there is, in fact, an ideal eternal history through which the particular histories, with an S, of all nations must pass over the course of time. It is this ideal history in a platonic sense which is the subject of Vico's new science. Alright, so if we move on now to section two on the elements, um, this is a section in which, quite frankly, there are so many axioms provided that I'm not able to tell you about all of them right now. I will just emphasize what I think are the most important ones. So I recommend you to read the, the text yourself um, in its entirety, of course. But I still think that um, the treatment of the axioms in this video will still show you a system of knowledge which um, can very impressively uh, uh, lead one to uh, derive the kind of results which Vico will um, will show us of the rest of this book. So just as Euclid's elements had begun with a handful of axioms, rational postulates, and elucidating definitions, which could then be used to build up ever more complicated results, the validity of which can always be demonstrated in an irrefutable yet unambiguous manner, Vico proposes a similar methodology for this work and actually begins listing out the axioms of his new science one by one in this section. The first axiom he provides is the idea that by its very nature, the human mind is indeterminate. This is in contrast, one might argue, with Descartes' obsession with the human mind's ability to entertain the clear and distinct ideas, which could allow for a mathematical formalization even of the cosmos itself. In contrast, Vico's um, interest in the indeterminacy of human thinking allows him to um, basically derive the following two propositions. The first one is that rumor grows larger as it spreads, kind of like a fish tends to get a little bigger every time the story of how it was caught gets told. On the other hand, presence and rumor are inversely proportionate to one another. That is to say, um, presence diminishes rumor and rumor tends to expand or whatever the further you get away from the presence of the thing that it's talking about. So this becomes a problem you could imagine with history because what is history except trying to deal with rumors of things that are not at all present to us. They're very very far away like thousands of years ago. So the second axiom tells us that the human mind uses ideas of things known to form ideas of things unknown. So just as Oswald Spengler noted that um, we judge past civilizations in terms of our familiarity with our own civilization rather than actually try to understand them on their own terms. Um, the um, thing which Vico tries to uh, show with this axiom is the uh, foundation for the empirical fact that all the pagan civilizations in the ancient world had claimed to be the first or the inventor of X, Y, or Z, 
and claim that the others happen to have the same thing only because they had directly borrowed it from them. This is the conceit of nations, as Vico calls it, which is parallel to the conceit of scholars, who similarly claim that their own knowledge is um, as old as the world itself. Both of these are, of course, fallacious propositions, which are ruled out by the laws of the new science, as we shall see in the course of our study of more of these axiomatic foundations. Another thing which Vico noted is that philosophy must elevate human nature rather than negate it. This is why Stoics and Epicureans were both flawed in that one overemphasized fate while the other overemphasized chance. In contrast, um, Vico proposes an axiom to prove the existence of divine providence and the fact that divine providence acts politically in this world through the legislation um, adopted by given civilizations, which serve the higher purpose of redirecting wild passions, which would be problematic, into instead institutions which are productive. You can redirect that energy into things like the military, or trade, or the court. Man is free by nature to turn potentially negative um, passions, in other words, into um, actually positive virtues. But due to the weakness of the human will, it can only do that if it is directed within a society by the guidance of God's own providence. Another thing which um, Vico mentions is that philosophy and philology have been separated to the detriment of both for far too long. But what is philosophy except the practice of using reason to arrive at a knowledge of abstract truths? And what is philology except a, an emphasis on creative authorship and the power of the will as to uh, faculties of the human subject. If the two are combined, basically you will get Vico's new science. It follows from the first axiom, of course, that human judgment by its nature is uncertain or indeterminate, so the question arises where exactly it can gain certainty. Vico's answer is quite interesting. He says it gains certainty from common sense, but what is common sense? That is a term which Gadamer mentioned etymologically speaking, meant something rather different centuries ago than it does today. Well, common sense for Vico is an unreflective judgment shared by an entire social order. One might say that these are things that one knows without having to stop and explicitly reflect on one's knowledge of it. If the same idea arises in many different civilizations which did not have any contact with one another to explain that away through the empirical fact of transmission, then they must have a common basis in truth. Vico argues that divine providence, that is to say, in a certain sense, God acting within the world, uses the common sense of the social order to guide us to look beyond local variations to grasp essential unities. Vico goes on to define and institutes nature as identical with its nascence, which is, of course, kind of a French word for birth. It sounds better in translation, perhaps, to say nature and nascence, because there's some alliteration there. But at any rate, um, he justifies this unusual claim by noting that um, an institute's inherent properties are produced by the manner in which they arise. This, of course, leads us to emphasize history over, say, mathematics to see how that works within time. This is why popular traditions, he claims, always have the same basis in truth. Even if the passage of time later envelops a truth in falsehood, that will still be the case. Likewise, a nation that developed with complete autonomy will preserve a purer testament to natural law even within its own language. The ultimate example which Vico gives is the Roman civilization and the Latin language. He tells us the nature of human institutions presupposes a conceptual language, although hypothetical, which would be common to all nations. 
and which could uniformly grasp the substance of all the elements of human society, which would then be later expressed in so many different ways, only according to the tendency for one to consider the same thing from the point of view of emphasizing different aspects. Axiom 1 to 4, therefore, deal with the fundamental principles of the origins of civilization. Axioms 5 to 15 deal with truth and eternal slash ideal form of the world of notions. Axioms 16 to 22 deal with certainty and historical reality. And with these axioms established, Vigo tells us we have the principles for the new science. Another thing he mentions in this section of the text in Axiom 23 is that the history contained in the Bible is older than any other account of history because it goes back to the time before the flood, whereas all the pagan religions developed in a long process of decline and then, I guess, rebirth in a certain sense of those who had survived the flood but still managed to disregard the true religion of Noah. Axiom 24 tells us that um, an interesting contrast is that Jews' religion was um, founded on God's prohibition against divination, whereas the pagan religions were founded on the practice of such divination. The historicity of the flood, then, can be proved through the study of myths insofar as every um, pagan society basically had some equivalent version thereof. Vicker goes on to recount Homer's strange claim that a quote-unquote language of the gods had been spoken long before his own time. Vico interprets this as proof of his own idea that the world of peoples began everywhere with religion. This is because religion alone is powerful enough to subdue a people which by that point of their own development had to have already been made fierce through the practice of warfare and with that Pandora's box of pathological drives opened, law in a purely secular sense could not repress them. This is where Hobbes was wrong, says Vico, for you cannot have a civilization without religion, because the fear of God, even in a confused or fallacious sense in, say, paganism, is the only thing which can repress those barbaric drives and make them conform to a properly social order. He goes on to note that um, the error of paganism stems from the tendency for us to fall back on attributing our own nature to things whose nature is unknown to us. We say, for example, even within, you know, trying to speak, trying to speak scientifically, that magnets love iron because we're personifying them in much the same way that early pagan religions had done with other natural phenomena. One trait of human nature is to be drawn into such superstition after falling into a state of fear from encountering the unknown within nature and then projecting that same superstition subsequently onto so many other unrelated items that we find. Reason and imagination then, this is very important, are inversely proportionate for one another. As Vico claims, peoples with less developed reason tend to have wild imaginations. The people of the first ages were then by nature poetic because they personified nature with their wild imaginations rather than use the power of reason to attempt to do something like what we call science today. In an epistemological genealogy of the world, then, he claims that ignorance begets curiosity and then curiosity begets knowledge. He notes once again that there was no lightning for several centuries after the flood because the earth was still so drenched with water that no flammable matter could be sent up into the air to ignite lightning. Because lightning went from being something that never appeared to something that suddenly appeared, but for naturalistic reasons, which the people at that time were not yet advanced enough to understand with the faculty of reason, you find the same mythological archetype appear in all pagan cultures independently to explain it away. The fear of lightning causes the archetype of Jupiter to appear in all pagan cultures, and then by extension, each one develops an identical archetype of Hercules, or the son of Zeus, who captures the error of thinking of heroic men as gods or demigods themselves. The essence of myth, according to Vico, then consists of so many poetic archetypes which personify nature and attribute godlike powers to things that are not, of course, the true god of 
um, Christianity and of the Jewish religion, that is to say, the, the God of uh, the Old and New Testament. Surprisingly, the earliest pagans were then poetic thinkers because they used archetype, or more specifically what Vico calls imaginative general categories. And they fell back on their wild imagination due to the failure of their own faculty of reason to produce categories in the properly modern logical sense of the term. It is a basic fact, then, says Vico, that the memory of things seen as a child tend to be later on expanded into a vivid imagination because, according to him, quote-unquote, imagination simply is expanded or compounded memory. This is from Axioms 48 and 50. Poetry is mimesis, then, because children excel in imitating what they see, and early civilizations excel in uh, poetic mimesis for the very same reason. In contrast with that mimesis and poetry, philosophy, in the proper sense of the term, comes later on with the development of reason, but the two differ also in logical terms in the following way. Philosophy rises up to universality through reflection, whereas poetry descends down to particularity through emphasizing feeling. Because people close the gap of uncertainty by attributing their own nature to that which is unknown, he tells us over time the Greek gods came to be misrepresented as every bit as foul and corrupt as the Greek humans living in something like an era of decline. Homer preserves that corruption but uh, in uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, but in contrast, within biblical history, you find no stories which actually cause us to feel shame, especially no stories of the behavior of God which could lead you to feel such shame. The first authors of pagan civilization were therefore um, also working within a trajectory of the development of speech which had been captured in the claim that in Egypt there were three different kinds of speech. The first one was um, hieroglyphic, uh, the second one was symbolic, and the third was vernacular, says one account which Vico repeatedly references. He also speculates that um, the uh, poetic verse always shows up earlier than prose within a given civilization is because song helps one to vent strong passions. And the constitution of the five senses are oriented beyond oneself towards things in the external world that you react to. In contrast, philosophy develops much later because it requires the exact opposite, that is to say, an inward subjective reflection that um, has the exact opposite orientation. Vico goes as far as to claim that the kind of words which denote um, external physical objects appear within a language earlier than the kinds of words which denote conceptual or spiritual contents. And the order in which such conceptual ideas appears further on within history is symmetrical to the order in which various types of institutions appear. The order of the latter, according to Vico, uh, are the forest, the hut, the village, the city, and then the academy. The order of what humans sense also follows the following order. He claims that first they deal with what is necessary, then they deal with what is useful, then comfort, then pleasure, then dissolution, before finally falling into madness and squandering their estate. The end of the process of historical development of a given civilization is then inevitably decline and fall. And this is something which Vico could acknowledge because he was writing before not just the Industrial Revolution, but the Fossil Fuel Revolution. As you say, Vico did not have his thought process structured by the deep meme of progress. See my earliest two books. He notes that um, each uh, state um, has different kinds of governments because the kind of government one finds is determined by the nature of its people rather than the other way around. For this reason, Vico did not accept the modern idea that law has no other basis than convention, human opinion, or people's agreement to, um, to go along with it. He notes that um, even the gift of God's grace enacting within the world is not enough to um, have uh, good within the world actually come about if it is not combined with the cooperation of the human world.
will. The natural law of nations is then inherently good because it was established by divine providence acting in the world and the corruption thereof only comes about as a secondary effect of the corruption of the people themselves. On the other hand, if you examine the kinds of laws which barbarous uh, people, that is to say people at a very early stage of advancement have, you'll notice that on a logical level, such laws tend to meet them where they're at by um, dealing with particular rather than universal ideas. Such laws then suffer from the flaw that they must be enforced by brute authority, whereas intelligent people, that is to say, more correctly, people inhabiting a more advanced civilization, um, tend to evaluate how just a law is, not um, in terms of its ability to meet one particular a circumstance on an ad hoc basis, which concerns one in the here and now, but rather in terms of its ability to bring about the universal benefit of all parties involved. So that will conclude our discussion of section two, which once again, I'd recommend you to read in its entirety to catch all of the axioms. Alright, so if we conclude our discussion of book one with the much shorter third and fourth sections in uh, uh, section three principles, Vico claims that no matter how barbarous a given civilization might be, it will still inevitably have the following three universal cultural staples. These are religion, marriage, and the burial of the dead. Of the world's religions, further, he claims that all of them basically um, can be fit into one of the following four general headings. You have the religion of the Jews, uh, that of the Christians, the Muslims, and finally the religion of the pagans. The concept of God does not admit of endless arbitrary variation, for even among uh, religions that Vico would consider to be false, like say the religion of the pagans, you have never actually had an idea of God that characterize him as, say, a pure body, or as a pure spirit, but one without freedom, to use his own kind of strange examples. The institution of marriage is another universal cultural staple for the pragmatic reason that, according to Vico, children who did not have parents would be abandoned to nature and would be quickly devoured by dogs. Further, without somebody to instruct them in moral and religious um, subject matters, the children would inevitably revert to the kind of animalistic barbarism that would quickly collapse the established civilization into a state of lawlessness and violence and would negate all of the development that it had undergone before that point. He claims that the third institution of the burial of the dead is universal within societies because only if that is established can one recognize the soul as immortal. And that really makes sense if you think about it because if somebody is dead, the only way that their spirit can continue to wander and haunt the earth if the dead body is not given its due honor is if you have some sort of platonic dualism established on philosophical grounds. Section 4 on method, he claims that his own method will differ from that of his predecessors, and he does this by uh, trying to solve the mystery of when exactly humans became fully human. Now, obviously, the, um, something like humans had maybe existed before, but those were beasts. They were animals. When did humans actually become human in the proper sense of the term? Well, he claims that the only thing which could bring that about would um, be a an idea that could um, tame the instincts of the beast simply on maybe notional grounds. And the only idea which could do that is the idea not only of a god, but of a god which inspires fear. But it's not only fear. Um, it's also um, something that we fall back on even in our personal lives when we find ourselves in a state of despair in which the circumstances of our own life are so dire that we cannot trust ourselves to save us from them. We can only defer our hopes for salvation onto an almighty and all good being who can do what we cannot. You also might have noticed, as Vico says himself, that people tend to become more religious as they get older and closer to death, as death is the ultimate predicament which one cannot solve on one's own. Insofar as animals think, says Vico, they think in surges of passion. But humans differ from any natural bodies because the latter are, f are fully determined in their movements by, say, the laws of nature, but we have free will. 
Likewise, all of the virtues must reside in that human will. The institutions, he says, also make us fully human because when a man marries, he is no longer solely consumed in his own self-interests because now he cares about the well-being of his wife and children. When the same man enters into civil society, he now seeks out the good of the whole city rather than just himself or even his own family. And when that nation expands to encompass more, more cities, he seeks the good of the whole nation. And when alliances are formed with other nations, he seeks the universal good of the whole human race. It is therefore by divine providence itself, as you say in a certain sense, God acting within the world, that the individual exists not in a state of wild isolation, but always as a smaller part of such broader social institutions. These institutions do not exist as a result of human planning or even human knowledge because they often actively contradict both. They must exist rather due to um, the divine providence having bestowed their existence within history um, on us in the first place. They are then universal and eternal, even though man himself is temporal and caught up in the flux of history. This book then seeks to contemplate the world of nations in their divine and ideal form in a platonic sense. The earliest time and place of history then is where and when human thought as such arose. And because the new science traces ideal eternal history through which each nation passes in time within a life cycle, Vico's method is like that of Euclid's elements, building up results from a set of basic elements. But he uh, provides the following um, distinction between his own science and that of Euclidean geometry by claiming that my proofs are divine. They're not even the result of my own thinking or creativity. They're rather the, um, the truths of, of God himself. And anyone who is lucky enough to contemplate them will have a literally divine pleasure in doing so.